Welcome to Sky Talkers. Here are your hosts, Charlotte and Caitlin. Hello, and welcome to Sky Talkers. I'm your host, Charlotte. Hey, everyone. I'm your other host, Caitlin, and welcome to this episode of Sky Talkers, where we are talking all about this week's episode, The Bad Batch, Season 3, Episode 15, Series Finale, The Cavalry Has Arrived. And I cannot believe that we have reached the end of The Bad Batch. I feel like I've been waiting all week for this to come out and thinking about it. And then I just spent all day thinking about it after I had watched it. I thought it was so Mm. good. I'm really excited to talk about it. I still haven't really processed it. The processing will happen in this episode, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But I can't believe we're saying goodbye to The Bad Batch. It has been such a journey. And I can't believe this is this was so good. The series is amazing <laughs> and we are so lucky and I'm obsessed with all the characters. The I don't know. I loved this finale. Can we celebrate so much. that our dark speculation of sacrifice did not really come to fruition as far as literally our- the only sacrifice is freaking his hand. I know. And I know. That was good and uh, honestly. <laughs> so it's like we'll, we'll talk about all that, but I mean in terms of like who we care about I honestly, sorry, I have to say, Nala say was a sacrifice. It was, it was, but as far as the the bad batch themselves go, yes, we definitely. Yes. I remember talking about our text conversation mid season of us when we decided we couldn't rank the bad batch. <laughs> we were I like, know. wait a second. Well, <laughs> I know, I know. Well, there was a lot of moments because I think for us in that one conversation that we had about like, well, we wow, who are gonna we going to be the saddest if they die? Yeah. And it really ended up being like oh my God, if Wrecker dies, that like to me, it was like, oh, that feels insane. And I felt like there were so many moments really... in this episode where I was like, are they going to do this? Yeah. I can't handle it. They didn't. So yeah, bless. I know they they really um, put us through the ringer uh, mm-hmm. with, with Wrecker, I think specifically in this episode, uh, mm-hmm. he was not doing well. <laughs> Mm-mm, not mm-mm. at all. <laughs> no, nope, no, nope, but a lot of it wasn't necessarily a fake out, but it really did think that, oh, are we heading to some foreshadowing? Like everyone's very weakened. We're really yeah. in our lowest point, which of course we are. We're jumping ahead of ourselves. It's Star Wars week. It's a crazy week for Caitlin and I, not going to lie to you. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, this is our third podcast we've recorded in three days, and it's just a lot. So. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of feel a little bit like we're chickens running around with our heads cut off a bit. No, like literally I feel crazy. That's why the processing that will happen in this episode, it's going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, very insane. Yeah. So by the time you're listening to this, um, we'll have had our Tales of the Empire roundtable interview, which should be up uh, by the time you are downloading this episode. And then we have our full Tales of the Empire discussion that will be out this weekend on May the 4th. And then this episode is out this week too. So just just a, just a lot of recording. And then Charlotte and I are going on a very fun trip that we're leaving tomorrow at 5 a.m. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. you should definitely head over to all of our social media accounts to see what we're up to. It is Star Wars related and it's so exciting. I'm so excited. I know. <laughs> um, I know. But it, even talking about it right now it feels like we're jinxing something. I know, right? But... Uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll already be there when you're hearing this. So please go and check it out we're we're super pumped but it has been a crazy week so this is yeah it's I feel like all that craziness and energy and um adrenaline I guess I should say will probably come through in in this discussion yes okay let's get into it episode 15 the finale of the bad batch directed by Stuart Lee Saul Ruiz Brad Rao written by Jennifer Corbett the goats um I feel like (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Today is May 1st, and we are here talking about the end of The Bad Batch. And this episode was 50 minutes. We got a super long mega episode. Mm-hmm. I can't believe it. <laughs> well, let's start at the top with the logo change. Yep. I was not... Well, okay. Actually, let me start off by saying this. First off, when I don't know what happened to my Disney+, Plus, but somehow it set me back to episode one season one. Mm. And so I didn't really notice that I was so anxious, you know, I'm not really thinking straight. And so the logo appears, but the first episode of the Bad Batch is the Clone Wars logo that Mm -hmm, dissolves mm -hmm. into the Bad Batch logo. And I was like, what, 
what is going on? <laughs> just experiencing Order 66 once again. Yeah, yeah. One more time, just for good measure. <laughs> and I was very confused for a couple seconds until I realized that I had not clicked on the correct <laughs> series finale, yeah. episode 15. So anyway, but the logo change, I think it's becoming a bit of a hallmark with TV shows like animation this. finale, yeah, animation finale. Yeah. So they did this all throughout um, the, the Clone Wars. yeah, the Clone Wars uh, during the Siege of Mandalore episodes, and then you know seeing it here was very somber. No red burn marks, whatever you want to call it, on their logo. It definitely put me. It didn't necessarily ease my anxiety as I was going into this viewing of what was going to happen. I'll say that. Yeah. For sure. But looking back on it with no red burning, I, I, I think that you could say that that sort of symbolizes stress and stress. violence. And the fact that we're starting without that sort of means that we're on a journey of healing, kind right? Like a fresh start. They can where it's a fresh design start. their new And logo. I think that's what we got in this finale. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I loved it so much. I, okay. The last 15 minutes positively wrecked me in a really big way. I think I was not prepared like when I was doing our show notes and like reviewing some of these scenes and stuff like this. I was completely overcome with how emotional I got. And you and I have talked about this before. Like the first time you see a new Star Wars, you're kind of – it is adrenaline. It is like a little bit of anxiety. Mm -hmm. I don't think you fully feel the feelings of it, to be quite honest. At least I don't usually. Mm -hmm. It's not until later in the processing and all of that that I feel like I fully take in everything that has happened. And I guess just to get it out of the way, but those last 15 minutes when they rescue Crosshair and Hunter, rescue her from Hemlock, we get rid of Hemlock, the epilogue, epologues (laughs) epilogues <laughs> and everything. <laughs> I was just so overcome and I we've been like a broken record about this this season, but just you and I's journey with the clones and the bad batch and coming to love them so much and it's ending and they just got this beautiful happy little ending and I could not be more satisfied. Um I know. But we had to I go know. through a lot <laughs> to get there, <laughs> specifically here on Tantis and They went through so much. I was worried at every turn what was Mm -hmm. going to happen, especially because, you know, we start off with Hemlock kind of talking about when he's talking to Rampart, when they've captured Rampart, about how the clone's failure is inevitable. And we see a couple of times throughout that he is still a couple of steps ahead of them, even when he has the rest of the Bad Batch captured. And they're like, no, they're going to exploit our weaknesses. And he's like, yeah, I'm counting on it because that's going to bring Omega to me. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. he was he's just such a good villain. I'm so glad to see him go. <laughs> but he really was great to hate. He really, really was. And it, just like you said, at every turn, I was nervous. Yeah. You know, I feel like you and I are kind of all over the place with our discussion. Normally, we go kind of chronologically through an episode, kind of. Uh, but maybe we should go by character because I definitely think there were some standouts in this series finale. I think they all show, shown, but I think there were definitely some standouts. So maybe we should start with with Crosshair. Should we start with Crosshair? Let's start with Crosshair. All right, let's start with Crosshair in the forest when they're trying to okay. break in because this scene really broke my heart when they're trying to get into Tantus. And it's when it's when we first get really worried about Wrecker, right? Because they're out of med patches. He was dueling with some beasts like he does. And Crosshair brings up Plan 99. And he mm-hmm. tries to get them to split up, basically to protect Wrecker and Hunter. And this heartbreaking little conversation that he has where he says, wake up, Wrecker. Clone Force 99 died with tech. We're not that squad anymore. I've been inside that mountain. I know what we're up against. If we all go in, we're not all making it out. Omega needs you both. So I'm doing this alone. It's what I deserve. Which, oh my God. And then- The fact that he's like, it's what I deserve. uh, Crosshair, I just want to, I want to give you like a hundred hugs. It's okay. It's- uh, so much trauma that comes from Tantus yeah. and him thinking he's not good enough too. There's so much there. And the fact that the next quote is the, the Hunter and Wrecker are like, there's just no way we're doing that. That's not yeah. how how it is. 
Yeah, yeah. They say, um, don't even think about Plan 99, Crosshair. Omega needs all of us, and so do those clones. And I I love this line. The Wrecker says the next line. He says, we've always known the risks, and so did tech. We do this together. And I really enjoy the moments when we get a pretty serious Wrecker because – that's not his usual persona, right? That's just not him. So I always think when he kind of slips into more of this serious discussion, it's, I don't know, I, I really enjoy it. I like hearing um, kind of that tone from him. And I just really loved how they they stuck together. And even later after they've been freed from Hemlock's conditioning, torture devices, chambers, whatever you want to call them, and uh, Hunter goes out to save to find Omega and he tells Crosshair to stay there and and Crosshair says not a chance. I just, Mm -hmm. I think Crosshair has come so far and the fact that he was so scared to come back to Tantus was willing to do it for Omega and also wanted to make sure that Wrecker and Hunter would be safe too. Like he sent his original plan was for them to go to the communications tower and call Rex. He didn't even want them to go into Tantus and the fact that they all stayed together they really just have come so far. Crosshair is such an incredible character and jumping straight to the end again with the with Hemlock and their standoff, we finally see him make the shot. <laughs> he he yes. <laughs> and he lost his hand. Yes, <laughs> we need to talk about this. So the fact that he made the shot and his hand is okay, so if his hand as we've talked about for many many podcasts so far his hand tremoring like it's very clear that crosshair has so much trauma from what he experienced on tantus right and it's unaddressed he is dealing with it sort of silently but the moment we get closer and closer to tantus his hand starts shaking so much Mm -hmm. right and it's so interesting that we have this situation because we've seen hands being chopped off so much in star wars it's it's almost like a hallmark of Star Wars at this point. And I'm it was played as painful. I'm not saying it wasn't, but his hand being chopped off f- for me the way I saw it was this represents Crosshair finally being free of that trauma that he felt at in Tantus. And this happens obviously in Tantus and I just feel like he's free at that point now when he makes that shot, he makes the shot because he he's next to his brothers. He's going to save Omega, but his, his that that part of him that really represented the trauma is severed. It's gone, and hands couldn't be more of a language. I have to say, right? Uh, you do say. I say too. We mm-hmm. so say we all. Uh, so say, <laughs> so we, say all. we all. <laughs> I think that it's also you know kind of jumping off of that that it is that identity too as a sniper that. This skill was something he wanted to have mastery over again because what is his purpose if not to be the best sniper out there? And the fact that he wasn't able to do that and I think losing his hand, his dominant hand, is also metaphorical for the fact that this doesn't have to be his identity anymore, Mm -hmm. that he can move on, let go, I guess, in a way. Of course, it's a very, um, like, traumatic let go, you know, lo- losing the hand. The I wasn't even sure that he'd actually lost it when they were in that battle because they cut away from it so quickly. Mm-hmm. And so then later to get confirmation that he actually did was just – it was really heartbreaking and, like, very violent, honestly. But I think for mm-hmm. Crosshair, I think it, it – it means a lot. It's specific that it happened to him as a character and not someone else in the Bad yeah. Batch or that we know. And that scene, that standoff with Hemlock, where he's having to do it, make this shot with his non-dominant hand. We, we've literally been talking about this all season of when is Crosshair going to make the shot? And we freaked out when he missed the shot <laughs> back in Point of No Return. And here he is with literally all the odds stacked up against him in the place that has caused him so much trauma with the, standing across from the person who caused all of that trauma, Hemlock, who now has kidnapped the person that means the most to him. It, and it's raining too, like low visibility. <laughs> it just could not be more difficult circumstances. And I thought that... D. Bradley Baker did such an incredible job of playing Crosshair and Hunter in this moment of the emotion behind both of their 
what the, both of their lines of Crosshair's vulnerability and what's the word, just worry that he, hesitation that he wasn't going to be able to make the shot. He says, mm-hmm. I can't, they're too close. If I'm off, I can't risk Omega. He, You could really feel how scared he was. I think in that moment and Hunter on the other side is just so confident. He says she knows what to do. Wait for her. Then take the shot. There's no, he's not worried at all. And then neither is Omega across the way. She's looking straight at crosshair. She knows he's going to do it. And he does. And I, I just thought it was, it was so well done. The tension was there when Hemlock is telling Omega that if he falls, she falls, this whole thing. And Omega giving it right back to Hemlock, like we've seen her do a number of times, actually, of saying, you know, you're not actually going to hurt me. Like, you need me. You really need me now. So your threat is literally meaningless. You know, I just... I thought that was probably my favorite sequence in the whole episode was this standoff because it felt like everything had come full circle. And I I liked how it was raining too because it was raining on Camino in the season one finale. And Crosshair saves Omega in that moment too, even though he's still not with them. And here we have it. What what have we been talking about? Like how in the season one finale, Crosshair and Omega are standing on the platform on Camino separate Mm -hmm. and he Mm -hmm. doesn't go with them and she Mm -hmm. wants him to. And now here in season three finale, he's the first person she runs to and hugs after he has saved her again by making the shot. Just And the the first person she hugs. Yeah. Okay. We need to dwell upon the rain also. Mm -hmm. I I think that Camino parallel is so apt, but also, I mean, let's be honest. What am I going to say? Ooh, ooh, say Rain it. is say it, <laughs> baptism and renewal. So we, that's what we got. <laughs> <laughs> that hug really was that. Let's be honest. Like yeah. there was a full sense of renewal and breathe, like fully we can take a breath here and we know that things are going to be okay. Um, I also think that, like you said, it's a parallel to the season one finale for sure. I, I think it's also a parallel to just Camino in general mm-hmm. and just that concept of like homecoming and that home is no longer there for them um, and it doesn't need to be, but it is this familiar situation that I think just really brings us full circle. Um, and even just to go further back to talk about Crosshair again in that line where he says, clone, wake up wrecker, clone force 99 died with tech. We're not that squad anymore. I think it's so interesting that immediately wrecker and Hunter deny this and say that no we're sticking together um and whether or not clone force 99 from the clone wars is still a thing no they're 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 together they're in this all together it's just i'm again still processing it's a a lot (laughs) right it's like every single choice that was made was perfect except for one thing i have to say except for one thing what is it um we clowned. We clowned about the tech stuff. We, we clowned about CX2. We did, except for last week. I You did you decided to unclown. I, <laughs> down my clown mask. I was still really hopeful throughout this episode. You're wiping off the clown makeup. I, taking off the shoes, <laughs> returning the clown oh, no. car. I got it. Um it's just I I really thought we were gonna get that and I don't I don't know what to think about any of that. <laughs> I just don't. I don't know. I think a couple weeks ago I said I could never stand random masked men who appear as like semi side characters again. <laughs> right. And that's probably going to be true moving forward. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. We, we can't do this. We can't, no, we we can't, can't go through this we again. We can't. We and cannot do it. The hope was real and I'm still not even convinced that it wasn't true. <laughs> okay. okay, Charlotte. <laughs> I, 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 because there's a, then that means I, yeah, Heather, I, Hunter would have stabbed him. Yeah, that's wrong. Yeah. We can't have that. <laughs> I, <laughs> and also they resisted, they, they all resisted the torture chamber situation, which I assume they would have done to tech too, yeah. in order to make him a super soldier. That was the, I think that was the whole thing, but I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm just kind of in denial about that. Yeah. I think, I think it, it makes, it makes sense for it for tech to actually be gone. It makes sense for us to have read into a lot of things because that's mm-hmm. who we are as Star Wars fans. I think I can't say I'm happy that he's actually gone, but right. I it is it's it's bittersweet. And I I did like the line 
that, you know, we, we've known the risks and so did tech and, and even Crosshair mm-hmm. saying Clone Force 99 died with tech. I think it, for Crosshair, he, I, I don't think he said anything about tech dying, but this line of Clone Force 99 died with tech, I think packs a really big punch of what tech's death meant to Crosshair. Like it's symbolic yeah. of something for him and probably yeah. a lot of guilt there that he, he was like maybe if he had been there, the the, the or maybe if he didn't do the distress signal that allowed him to yeah the, allowed the batch to know about the fact that they're after Omega mm-hmm. wouldn't have brought them there, you know things like that. Yeah. And then the the line too of you know we knew the risks and so did Tech. I think it's it was a a good inclusion there of that they've all come to terms yeah. and accepted that Tech did what he had to do, and it's it's like honoring him in a way to be thankful for the choices that he made at that time, because where would they be now? You know what I mean? I I don't know. I thought, I thought these, we talked some about how, how much they have or haven't mentioned tech. Was it enough? Was it not enough? Whatever. But I think that these lines here, this conversation was really good to have about him, to include him in when it's actually just the original bad batch of crosshair Mm -hmm. wrecker and hunter talking about tech like these are the original four um Mm -hmm. so to bring it back to that nucleus i think of them kind of addressing as a group what happened and it's surrounded by crosshairs anxiety about all of them going into mount tantis together and what could happen i thought was really was really good not to mention that hemlock references tech as well uh, when he's torturing hunter too so Mm -hmm. i feel like they really they use I feel like tech is still felt in this show Mm -hmm. um I am still sad that he is truly gone but man oh man seeing his goggles in the ship (laughs) with Omega at the end in the second epilogue literally sent me over the edge (laughs) I know. And I texted Charlotte I go she's she's off to be a pilot and who in the rebellion and who taught her to fly tech tech taught her to fly oh my God. like i'm i'm tearing oh up God. right now it just <laughs> they he is still with them and yeah. i love that yeah I, also i hope that it's a, everyone knows it's kind of a joke that i'm not i'm i'm not upset about this like i i i think i've just been clowned about the cx2 <laughs> thing and i think it's it's our fault it's the audience's fault honestly i do sort of wish that there was a little i've talked about this before i wish there was a little bit more mourning but i think that this you're right that the finale did include that a lot and the epilogue really said a lot with those goggles and what you just said about how tech taught omega to fly it's great yeah yeah oh I really am tearing up. Um, (laughs) I sent Charlotte this voicemail after I finished it again, this voice memo, really on the verge of like full on sobbing. I was like, she's in the ship and Lula's there at the goggles and oh my God. It's like her support pieces. Yeah. So it's fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> Let's I, I think we should save Omega to talk about like at yeah. the end. And and I think Hunter kind of goes along with her in a big way in this episode. So maybe we should talk a little bit about um let should we jump to Echo? Okay. Echo, I think, played a really big role in this finale. Yeah. I think that there's I, I Echo's been in and out, I think, throughout this entire season. Him and Emery working together, I think, was a really good choice. And while this finale feels very um, serious, and there was a lot of things that were so serious, um, I, Echo continues to be the king of comedy and just has <laughs> really great comedic timing. And it always surprises me. Um, but I really, I, I was worried for him throughout, but then also a little less worried about him than others because he yeah. was with Emery. And for some reason I had this, I just had this feeling that Emery was going to survive. And I felt like since she made her, choice to change and do things for good it felt like she had most of the answers to figure out how to do that Mm -hmm. I think there's something about all the different people especially in this finale that Omega has inspired she really was the spark that lit the fire for this resistance like I know (laughs) I know but I like just the the kindness that Omega shows Emery allows for Emery to do the heel turn to decide to realize that she was wrong about this place and to do as much as she can to help the kids get out. And then Echo is able to be protected by that. And that feels like a direct 
response to Omega showing compassion. And then the fact that Omega was immediately like, I'm going to help you kids get out too. And then I, I don't know. I just feel like this all was done really brilliantly where every, every action that was f- from compassion kind of can go back to Omega. And I really just appreciated that. I know I went off a little bit on a tangent because I know we were talking about Echo, but it feels like Echo and Emery were together this entire episode anyway. So I felt like I had to had to share that. Yeah, I I really enjoyed them working together and I the whole time they were in their way to the vault. I was in a weird way very excited for them to get there and for Echo to realize that Omega had already escaped. I knew. I was like he's going to be so proud. <laughs> And then he was. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And the whole, everything about the Zillow Beast was so funny to me because it was like, oh, is that a distraction? Who would have done that? And it was like, oh, th- oh that's God. fully Omega. Yeah. And the reason why Omega would do that is because I would do that. That's what we yeah. would do, you know? And I I just, I love that so much. I also think that the Zillow Beast situation was less than I was expecting. Mm-hmm. I really was expecting a, we've talked about this for a while, a like, let every one of the exotic animals that they're testing on go type situation when really it was a distraction. And now the Zillow Beast is free and I'm assuming happy and then just (laughs) happy. I don't know. (laughs) I I sort of expected a little bit more with the Zillow Beast. It was, he was very helpful and he did create a (laughs) distraction and an entrance into (laughs) Tantus, which makes sense. But I, I sort of expect I expected someone to ride the Zillow Beast. I don't know. I don't know. I kind of thought the Zillow Beast would would be the end of the episode. That it breaking out would be like we kind of we were done with the Zillow Beast kind of twenty ish minutes, however long into the yeah. episode. I think that's what I was surprised about. I think I thought the Zillow Beast was one of two things. I either thought Mount Tantus was a lot smaller than it is, or the Zillow Beast was a lot bigger than it was, which I think was great to see actually throughout um, because you do get a really good idea of the scale of this place. Because when the Zillow Beast breaks out through the hangar, it's, it barely, like it makes a big hole. Don't get me wrong. It does a lot of damage, but it's not that much when you compare it to the scale of Tantus. And I think that um, when he first escapes, everyone doesn't really even realize it because it, the the facility is so big that you don't even hear that you don't hear the Zillow Beast itself. Like Hemlock and Scorch have to be told that the Zillow Beast has escaped. And I think I thought the Zillow Beast, I don't know, I, I was not keeping track of the scale of all of these things. And I thought that this episode did a really good job of displaying just how vast Mount Tantus is. That the Zillow Beast, while yes, a very large, dangerous creature, is um, still very small compared to Mount Tandis and everything going on inside yeah. of it. I had yeah, to absolutely. laugh at all of those stormtroopers trying to shoot the Zillow Beast. I I loved it. I loved him rampaging through Mount Tantis. Just he was like, I am ready to kill all of you. I hate you all. <laughs> Get me out of here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that he did. I mean, that was the energy that they were carrying through also. Right, yeah. The the clones that ended up joining Hunter and Wrecker too. Yeah. Um, the, that was the energy that started us all off. Let's be honest. It really did. And the <laughs> I, I also have to say that I was very surprised that uh, the baby Byron Baron that he could fit into those ducks on the sling on Jax's back. I also thought that those were much narrower when we saw Omega first going through them. <laughs> Yeah, but he's fine. He's fine. And apparently he likes the sound of the Zillow Beast and it puts him to sleep. I thought that was really funny. It's me too. <laughs> <laughs> what does Jack say? He says, this is what puts him to sleep Ugh, while they're <laughs> hiding in the wall. <laughs> it was it was really funny. I will say, though, that Echo and Emery were a great duo. And I loved Emery just to go back to Emery a little bit. I loved her explaining to Echo what has been going on and how and and you know really verbalizing that she was wrong about a lot of things. Um she says I was wrong about this place and I'm trying to do the right thing. I mm-hmm. didn't know about these children here until recently and since I found out I've been trying to figure out a way to help them and now you're here so let's help them. And I love too that Echo 
his first priority is the kids here. It's Omega, but it's the kids now all together. And even when he hears that the rest of the Bad Batch has been captured, he says to Emery, he's like, I'll, he basically is like, I'll figure that out later. But you know, we got to figure, we got to get to the kids first. This is the mission. Yeah. Which right is now. whatever, yeah. which is what the rest of the Bad Batch would have said as well. Mm-hmm. And you always, you need someone like Echo uh, on your team. And he just always, mm-hmm. he always has a plan. He is just, he's focused. He's so, so focused. He's so good. And then later when it's him and Omega, number one, I love that Echo didn't even question that Omega would stay with him to rescue the rest of the Bad Batch. He, it, he wasn't like, no, Omega, you should go with Emery and be safe. He was like, we'll meet up with you on Pabu later. Let's go, Omega. You know, they just worked so well together. And I love the concept of Echo tracking Omega through Tantis, following her distraction because it's how she was trained by the rest of the Bad Batch to do something like that. I, again, I knew that he would be so proud of her and he totally was. (laughs) And I eat that crap up. (laughs) I love it so much. (laughs) And for a while, when I was watching the two of them together, um, I was, I was totally envisioning a world where Omega goes off with Echo actually at the end mm-hmm. to help more clones mm-hmm. because they just seemed so in sync as they were going through Tantus. Um, and I, I've said this a couple times throughout the season, but I have always really appreciated the moments that Echo has with Omega because I always mm-hmm. think he passes on like good wisdom to her. He always gives her these like cute little pep talks and stuff and he has been in and out. So they've never he hasn't had the time, right, that the rest of the Bad Batch has had, but it's always really meaningful when he is with her. And I didn't feel any different in this finale. Yeah, I always felt that Omega and Echo had a special bond Mm -hmm. because Echo was a late addition as well to the Bad Batch. And then Omega is too. And I think that they've worked really well throughout all three seasons. I can't believe we're like putting a cap on all of this. It's so sad. It's, I just, it doesn't, it doesn't feel real to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I guess maybe we should also just, I guess to kind of round out, sorry, let me start over. To round out Echo and Emery, we can go to the end as well. When Emery takes off the glasses, she takes off the scientific glasses Right. Felt, so it's like a new woman. I felt like <laughs> those cliche, you know, beauty pageants or um I know. ugly duckling I was where like, they, who is they that? take off the glasses and suddenly she's beautiful. <laughs> suddenly she's not an evil scientist. <laughs> I know. I was like, oh my gosh, she looks so much softer. Right? I think that um, that was the situation. Yeah. But she and Echo are going to Pantora to talk to Senator Chuchi about what they know. And that was something we speculated about was this idea of knowledge and the keepers Mm -hmm. of knowledge and what happens to it. And I think that's actually a good transition now to go to Nala Say and Rampart, but Mm -hmm. really Nala Say. Mm -hmm. You said she was Mm -hmm. the sacrifice and she totally was. And it was very heart-wrenching, her conversation with Omega um, in the middle of the episode when everyone is freed from their prison cells. And she's, she's doing this. She's doing this for Omega and for the so the empire won't have that knowledge and she tells omega like the only way you'll be safe is if i destroy those databanks and of course omega is like all right let's go and nala say says no your place is with them and i just <sighs> nala say i feel like has been a big question mark for me throughout a lot of the bad batch of what are her true motivations why does she really care about omega and I, I think some of that I might still have, like what even made her care about Omega in the first place. But you, it all comes back to science for her. Yeah. I think as much as I think she was and was compassionate about Omega, there's no, I think there's no doubt about that. Yeah. But I think for, and I, I don't say it all comes down to science for her as like, as a negative. I think that she was proud of her culture, her heritage, her identity, mm-hmm. and that's all wrapped up in that. And her sacrifice is preserving that. Because they can't go in the wrong hands. And I think that that also was wrapped up in Omega, who's also from Camino, and how yeah. how that relates to her because she, in a lot of ways, was her, was her mother figure growing up. Her uh, Omega was her helper and everything. Yeah. So I think Nala says sacrifice. I wasn't even sure we were going to see her again. I was very happy that we did here. And I it, this really touched me. When freaking Rampart started to creep up on Nala Say when she was getting the data and, you know, I'm going to mention it one last time. It was very Jurassic Park, all <laughs> the d- little like pods and everything. 
when Rampart sneaks up on Nalase, I was like, okay, he's going to try to do the Dennis Nedry thing of trying to steal the science that was like behind Jurassic Park, basically, and use it for his own gain. But what happens in Jurassic Park, he dies by his own hubris. And that's exactly what happens here, where he thinks he can get away with it. And instead, Nalase is the one to sacrifice herself and her her knowledge and isn't able to get out. And she blows them both off. I, I think this was such an amazing choice because I was so shocked when Rampart grabbed that gun and and holds it to her head. I, this might have been the most shocking moment to me. <laughs> it was this one and the hand being um, removed from, from Crosshair. But I really, really dig how they dealt with this story overall and the fact that Rampart was the Dennis Nedry Jurassic Park character just makes so much sense to me. And because all of a sudden he had this like turn for humor, same thing that happened in Jurassic Park. So... That's it. I'm done. I'm done with the Jurassic Park references. <laughs> it's been three seasons. I don't know. It's <laughs> what, When will the next one come? Who's to say? I don't know. I mean, I could have brought it up when we talked about the Zillow Beast, but I didn't because this is totally that what happens at the end is very much with the T-Rex still roaming island, island at the well, end. Look, night, um, night, you brought it up. Okay, I brought it. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, I, I, I dropped another oh, Jurassic, no. Park Jurassic Park reference. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I thought as soon as Nalase was talking to Omega about destroying the knowledge, to me it felt very Captain going down with her ship, like this is her life's work, and that she will – that we I was pretty confirmed at that point that we would not be seeing her again. And I, I was worried when Rampart came that – there was a chance that he could succeed in taking the knowledge or taking something with him. And I, I think that would have made a lot of sense. I think it would have been another ominous kind of piece of the finale, very much like how we get Tarkin at the very end talking about Project Stardust, a.k.a. the Death Star. Um that Rampart then would have been another factor because we know they're still working on Project Necromancer, but would they be starting from zero or, you know, I, I, my head was kind of spinning with, okay, maybe Rampart has something that he's able to escape with. And there's kind of this um, sadness there that not all of the knowledge is truly destroyed that uh, Nalase wanted to do, but that's not what happened. And she was able to destroy it all in destroying them both. And I remember thinking like, I hope she... Saw like this sounds so weird to say, but I hope she saw the detonator go off to know that she she did it. You know what I mean? Does that sound weird? Yeah. (laughs) But (laughs) I wanted her to know that she did succeed. You know, and that Rampart wasn't a threat, and that Omega was going to be safe, and this knowledge would not be used by the Empire. Uh, I yeah, I I really liked that scene, and I was pretty surprised by it too. To be honest, I thought that maybe they would have gotten away with something, would have gotten away with it too, if it weren't for those clones. Um. <laughs> All right, are we are we ready to talk about Omega and Hunter? Yeah. All right, you start us off. Okay. Caitlin. Okay. I think let's start with Omega. Um. She, <laughs> I love her so much. <laughs> yeah, same. I, it's like, she's like my daughter and I, just, I love her and I'm so proud I of her. Already, she just inspires everyone. tearing up again. <laughs> I I, she was so incredible. <laughs> you, we've already talked about her having the plan and doing the thing. Echo's so proud of her. It's great. But her leading these kids through all of this, through this maze of, of interior ductwork, it's just of... Let, she literally let loose the Zillow beast. Are you kidding me? The Zillow <laughs> beast. She and she's she just snuck out of the the tubes, the ducks, and and even I don't know. I just there's so much to admire about Omega, and it's her confidence and her kindness and her like true belief in doing the right thing and in her true belief in the power of her family, of her brothers at every turn. And she is so confident in that. And I saw some people talking about how even if they hadn't been able to get to Tantus, Omega still would have figured out a way off of Tantus because of all the training that she's received from them. She did it once. She'll do it again. You know, that's what she tells the kids. And that great little scene of her and the kids when they're about to climb up the ladder after 
the Zillow beast is gone and Jax is talking about how he's scared of heights. And she just has yeah. the perfect thing to say to him about Wrecker and what she's learned from Wrecker of he's really scared of heights too. And he's the strongest person I know. So uh-huh. you can do and it. just look, look ahead. Not yeah. I was like, <laughs> Oh my God. Just, it was so per- I, I'm also, I was really happy that they brought that around mm-hmm. because Wrecker being afraid of heights has happened in a couple of occasions. It happened in the season two finale as like a big thing, right? That he is overcoming. He's looking forward, you know, what Omega says. But I, I love that that quote unquote weakness is able to inspire a piece of strength, I guess, within this. It was it was really good. I think I we touched a little bit on her dynamic with Hemlock, but in the season opener, she definitely gave Hemlock a couple of like biting mm-hmm. comebacks and mm-hmm. stuff, which at the time I was like, she is she's so brave. <laughs> and she's yeah. still so brave. <laughs> and <laughs> literally the entire mountain is falling apart around her. And she is just so confident that she will be safe and that her brothers will fight for her and they do. And the, when Hemlock says a glaring weakness in clones is their loyalty to one another. Thank you for proving my, proving my point. And then a little later in the conversation, uh, when they find out that all the data has been destroyed by Nala say, uh, Omega says you failed. Your data is still gone. And Hemlock very sinisterly says, but I still have you. And she says, you're forgetting one thing. I have them. And it, mm. <laughs> it's, it's so good. And a patron in our Discord had pointed pointed out that this um, quip from Hemlock about clones' loyalty being their weakness is very similar to what the Emperor in Return of the Jedi tells Luke when he says that his faith in his friends is his weakness. And I thought that was such a great comparison because both Hemlock and the Emperor are very much proven wrong. And that is that that's the message, right? That loyalty mm-hmm. to your family, to your friends, um, love, love yeah, should always prevail. And And uh, it does. And I thought that was such a a great comparison to make in these two scenes. Um, And the fact that she still has the little tool that she uses to get out of the wall. um, And that's what she uses in the standoff with Hemlock with with Hunter and Crosshair, too. It felt very full circle that one that she kept it right, that she knew to keep that weapon. I kind of kept wondering if Echo was going to hand her a blaster or if she was going to use it throughout this escape from Tantus. And she didn't, but Mm -hmm. she had her own methods too. And I just, I'm so obsessed with her. And the scene of them all on Pabu, you, you know, I love Pabu (laughs) and the fact that we came (laughs) back and it was sunny and everyone was in like comfy clothes Except for the Bad Batch. They were still in their armor, even in that last... But their new armor that symbolizes their ever-changing experience (laughs) and how they're so... (laughs) They're they're their life and they've become more unique. I don't know. I... I, Let me back up. Let me go back to a little bit of the story structure that after the standoff with Hemlock on the suspended walkway... (laughs) I was so glad that they, that that was the end, you know, that they Mm -hmm. just got, they just got in the shuttle and they escaped right before the empire arrived again. I think sometimes Mm -hmm. we're conditioned to expect like every step of the process to be an uphill battle. And don't get me wrong. They definitely had an uphill battle in the whole first 40 minutes, but I just so appreciate that we had 15 ish minutes at the end of just kind of reveling in their freedom and in their safety and for Omega especially and seeing them all, seeing her and Hunter have this talk under the tree in the middle of Pabu and her asking like, what do we do now? And Hunter responding, whatever we want. And she just rests her head on his shoulder. I, like I said, I fully lost it. I was <laughs> just so overcome. I think we've talked a lot. I keep saying I'm so overcome. Stop me. But um, I think we've talked so much about, we've talked a lot about separation for Omega at mm-hmm. the end of this series. And technically we did get that, but mm-hmm. seeing it, how it played out, I was so glad that she, that it wasn't immediate, um, that mm-hmm. we were kind of wrong in that aspect of things. And We get a great moment kind of referencing this between Echo and Emery, where they talk about how they didn't have any childhood and our life was never our own. And that's exactly now what Omega 
gets and that that was so Mm -hmm. necessary for her now. And then, you know, uh, years later, she does do that separation, which is also so necessary for her. And I, her choice, her trying to sneak off of Pabu (laughs) and Hunter being there, (laughs) it was old man Hunter. I, did you think it was Omega when we first saw the figure going through? Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I was like, literally, I, I know I took off the clown makeup last week, but I was like, is that, is, is tech down there? Literally. My head was like, is, is oh my tech coming out of the water? <laughs> I was like, is this the final shot? And then so it, you <laughs> wouldn't have been this way if you thought he was the CX trooper. <laughs> <laughs> I, I took off the clown makeup, but the clown makeup is still in me. <laughs> I don't know. It's yes. Just, so I, when she turned on the light and it was, it was her, I was so surprised. I didn't think it was her until we, we saw her face. And and then seeing Hunter too, I just I love her story so much. She's such an incredible character, and this whole finale, the whole last half, I would really say of season three, has just put her in such the spotlight to show how much she has grown, and how confident and capable, and how much of a leader she is too. To really see her be a leader to these other kids, mm-hmm. I thought was the the cherry on top of kind of her whole character development. Yeah, absolutely. I think also we've talked a little bit on the show about Omega's uh, hero's journey. And the thing is, when she returns to Tantus, which I've, we've talked about before, but I think that you really see the completion of her hero's journey throughout this entire episode. She returns to Tantus with what they call with the elixir at the end of the hero's journey, where the hero is able to share what they've learned with everyone else. And that's what happens. She gets all the kids out. She inspires people to turn to the good side. That's what happens with Emery. She inspired also through her own actions, everyone to escape who basically deserved to, right? The the clones who helped uh, Hunter and Wrecker as well. It's like everyone is inspired by her even um, – just through certain actions, even without like meeting her. Mm -hmm. And then that even just spreads to the life that they built on Pabu at the end as well. That's, that's the elixir. That is like the love that Omega has shown. And then I think it's really interesting that the epilogue is her beginning that hero's journey cycle again. So the return to the elixir is the end of the hero's journey cycle. Um, And then she, in the epilogue, she experiences a call to adventure. And she has spent, I suppose, like 10 years, right? I guess we can assume experiencing the ordinary world, which is the very beginning of the hero's journey for years. And that ordinary world was good, but she feels she feels the call to ad- adventure and shares that with Hunter. And Hunter understands because he knows what it's like to go to be a hero as well. His His time is done, but she's off to continue to inspire and do the whole cycle of being a hero over again. I think it's so perfect. I I don't know. I was really astounded with how freaking satisfying everything was. And I think when we talk about the hero's journey and everything, it can often feel like maybe just we're checking boxes and that just is unsatisfying. But I think we've seen Omega grow so much and be such an inspiring hero that this I don't know. It's just really, really satisfying for the viewer and really inspirational. Um, I also have to comment just to kind of take us to a less serious zone. <laughs> okay. About how Gonky was there. When, oh, yeah, Gonky being there. God bless. <laughs> I mean, seriously, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> Gonky was there. Everyone who was on the like the 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 fact that the ship was there and she br- she brings Lula, which all her senses of comfort and reminders of home are with her. Um, but I, I'm a gonky stan, so very excited to see gonky. I wasn't expecting to see him again. I know, again, and honestly. the fact that he went with her too. He didn't stay behind. Of course, gonky is he belongs so to the ship, loyal. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the best. <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess it's a different um, ship, but it's a different ship. <laughs> yeah, <now>. yeah. <laughs> it's like it looks like the same ship. Uh, what do I know? <laughs> um, but what I was gonna say is, on Pabu, we get one final exquisite oh looking God. sushi shot. It's so good. I just want to eat it uh, has, there, has sushi ever looked this good in animation? I stopped myself because I'm just thinking about like studio. Yeah. Chicken, but th- th- honestly, r- I was like, should I order sushi today? Type no, of situation. They look so, it looks so good. I'm so glad that it looks amazing. <laughs> they took time in this incredible finale to be like, we need a sushi shot. 
<laughs> yeah, they knew that the fans were clamoring for more. You know what? Sushi I bet it was Kado. served on a beautiful raw edge table. <laughs> Exactly, Caitlin. Exactly. Made, you took the words right out. <laughs> made by the mayor chef himself. Well, also, did you see him? The whole gang is yeah, there. They were. Also. Yeah, I saw him. I was like, she chef. was there even. Everyone's there. And Pabu later in the epilogue, when we flash forward, looks more, more built up. Lots of lights. There's Maybe people lights. living there. It's just like, I, it's really lived in and safe and good. And I just, we got such a happy ending. I know, I know. And. <laughs> Hunter is a proud dad. The fact that he says, you're our kid. <laughs> Stop it. I just, Stop it. we haven't really gotten a lot of dad batch content. You know what I mean? I think that we, the audience have put that on them, but they haven't been like, oh no, she's our child. It's very rare occasions in which that happens, but this was the most fatherly we've seen and it hit so hard. Yeah. They nailed this perfectly it, and it, just really hard. It really hit. <laughs> the fact that it's it's Hunter and Omega at the end there, like it honestly it would be no one else. I think that this season was a building of a relationship between Omega and Crosshair for sure, because Crosshair has always had hope for I mean for Omega has always had hope for Crosshair, and that was from the very beginning. Yeah. But I I do feel like it makes so much sense that we'd round out the story with Omega and Hunter. Hunter being like the full-on leader, the keeper of the Bad Batch as a crew mm -hmm. and him giving his blessing to Omega. It is the going off to college. It is moving out of your home. It is her experiencing the call to adventure, Luke leaving Tatooine. It's the same thing. Just for some reason, it doesn't have to doesn't have to start with tragedy for her to go off and join the rebellion. I mean, I feel like this makes so much sense. I, I just was so satisfied. It's unreal. It's really unreal. <laughs> right. I think I also need to call out that older Omega is wearing a red headband, which definitely is a callback <laughs> to Hunter's red bandana, if you ask me. And uh, <laughs> it was so, I was like, wow, they really did that. They gave her a red, they gave her her own red headband because she's now going to be a leader in, you know, in out in the world herself after everything that she's learned. Yeah, I think it made total sense for everything to kind of come down to like these final conversations to be between Hunter and Omega because he was number one dad, dad number one, I guess I should say. And so it makes mm -hmm. sense. I do kind of wish we had had maybe one more line from Crosshair and Wrecker. Um, maybe not like I, I think it I think it was good to have the epilogue be just Omega and Hunter, um, but maybe like before then, just because I love them so much, you know, and we didn't get to see the Omega and Wrecker reunion. And I don't know, I just, <laughs> I, I think I'm still trying to say goodbye <laughs> to these characters. We're still processing. Know, it still, literally came out today. I still keep to, I, <laughs> we, you know, we talk about, we, we don't like to rank shows or movies on here, but we do talk specifically about how Rebels always makes us cry over Clone Wars. Even though mm -hmm. we, I would say we both kind of love them both immensely. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But for some reason, Rebels gets us. And I think Bad Batch might be giving Rebels a run for its money for me. Maybe it's just because it's... And I never expected this. It's insane. I, I've never teared up so much in a recording. I'll be honest. Um, thinking about <laughs> all these little these little moments. I'm, again, tearing up right now. Thinking about the stupid headband. Like, good God. <laughs> um, <laughs> and when she says, you know, like, take care of Wrecker and Crosshair for oh me. Gosh, shut that up, that shut they're up. still there. The that they're like old men. They, they just got to be happy on this planet. I literally could never have imagined that they would just get to be happy on this planet. Like... <laughs> I mean, we we did imagine. This, I did imagine it. I just didn't think it's it Star would... Wars and Star Wars is Star tragedy. tragedy. We never thought this would happen. I know. But instead, it's <sighs> it's a comedy. <laughs> it's... Wiping my tears. Star Wars is comedy. I... <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's really not. I'm so happy. But I feel like we really came full circle in the most heartwarming ending. The bad guys got what was coming to them. Yeah. The good guys got everything they ever wanted. <laughs> when when else and has this ever wins. happened? <laughs> the only okay, not everything they wanted because tech is still gone. Tech but, is still dead. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I okay, I did. There is something when you were talking about like uh, Omega's hero's journey and everything. There was something that I was kind of thinking about, and you'll have to work with me as I kind of spin this in my head. But a lot of people I saw online and in our Discord were talking about. Oh, so they went back to Pabu. Um, even though the empire has already been there. 
like, is it, is it still safe in the same way it was before? And I think we all kind of came to the conclusion that, well, Hemlock directed people to Pabu. So the knowledge probably died with him as well. Mm-hmm. So because everything was so secret. Exactly. So Pabu is now once again safe. And I was just struck about how this story, the centerpieces of this story, really across, you know, nearly three seasons of Camino, Tantis, I forget the name of the actual planet, um, and Pabu are all hidden planets, that they are all secret planets, which I find so compelling and interesting from a story perspective that the wider galaxy does not know about these places and the things that were happening on them, but that these huge stories and huge lives were playing out on them in in our Bad Batch, and that the thing that they did for the galaxy in destroying this knowledge at Tantis was so paramount, and no one knows about it, you know, and no one even knows about them because they're on this planet that doesn't exist on anyone's maps, (laughs) and Mm -hmm. we talked earlier this season about the Bad Batch having a smaller finale in the sense that they're not destroying the empire, of course, right? That is not the story that we're telling and that it would come back to them. And that's what happened. Uh, And they were still, I mean, technically they didn't even destroy the knowledge. Nala did, but it was part of that adventure and escape from Tantis. And I don't know, I'm just really kind of, (laughs) really kind of dwelling on the idea that, these three main set pieces in this show are all hidden um, from the Mm -hmm. larger galaxy. I think that's really interesting when you look at the bigger picture. And I think there's some, there's a parallel or something to be said about the, the nameless clones, the identical clones too. They're kind of one in the same as I'm sure a lot of people in the galaxy view them. Um, You could just, and the idea that you could just delete the clones like the government wanted to do, uh, like the empire wants to do that we've seen woven throughout this show of the, the politics of what to do with the clones. But that's not reality. They're all individuals Mm -hmm. and they all have these vast lives and Mm -hmm. um, our Bad Batch is part of that. And so is Omega. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I'm not really sure where that train went. No, I think that, I think you really commented on something though, that was a good part was when all the clones that were stuck in prison on Tantus got to verbally agree whether or not they want to help. Right. And Everyone did, and clones stick together. That's the whole thing. But they all, Hunter and Wrecker and Omega gave them an option to opt in or opt out. And that wasn't an option that they ever had before, right? That were They were born into this. But of course they're going to help because that's what they do. They stick together. Yeah. Well, <sighs> I think that brings us to the question we've asked since the very beginning of the Bad Batch that we knew we would eventually be leading to. We've been annoying about it. What is their purpose? What is their happiness? Do we feel like we accomplished that or set them on the path to accomplish that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There are, because at the end there, I think we, we get that all summed up in that conversation between Hunter and Omega, mm-hmm. not in the epilogue, but when Omega finally rests her head on Hunter yeah. because they can finally rest. They can do whatever the heck they want. They have the ultimate individualism. They are able to be their own heroes, not part of an army, not part of someone else's story. Yeah. And this is this is them start being able to start over. Yeah. And the, I mean they even talked about it too like they could just do whatever they want. Yeah. Um and I think some of them choose to continue to help against um or continue to help find the rogue clones and figure out what the legislation in the galaxy means for them. I think that the show didn't really tie that with a bow because I don't think they can. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this would be the place for it, but I do admire the fact that the show went to great lengths to even so show that Senate breakdown mm-hmm. really about what, what was going on there and it ended up being so interesting. And I think that you end with hope that all of that can be figured out somehow. Whether or not that's true, it doesn't necessarily matter. But when we close the book on the bad batch and we put it on the shelf like we feel that these characters have such a satisfying ending in their own lives because they're able to live away from the war away from what they were bred to do away from I don't know away from armies away from Camino away from scientific experiments away from 
the empire. I, I don't know. There's yeah. just so much. <laughs> I loved, you know, in that conversation between Hunter and Omega by the tree, when Omega, her first thought is all of these clones are safe now. And so are the kids. They're all safe. And of course, Hunter's first response is, and so are you. This that was Hunter's purpose this whole time was finding a way for Omega to be safe. And Omega, being the wonderful, kind-hearted person she is, is not thinking about her own safety in that moment or the fact – or she's not relishing in the relief of her own safety but in that of others. And to, in that same vein, so is Hunter, but it's specific about Omega. And that – we've been following that with Hunter this whole time. He's the one – everyone who has ever said something to Hunter about – you you can't just sit it out. You have to be involved because they're not going to stop. Like, you know, this whole they're not going to stop looking for Omega until like you can't just sit on the sidelines about all this. Even going back all the way to season one and what I think is the second set of episodes where they go find um, Cut, uh, the clone who married and had kids of his own. And it's like the first time that Hunter – kind of sees what it's like to be a dad and he's like whoa whoa (laughs) this is (laughs) what am I doing and I think Mm -hmm. Cut talks to him about um like how the kid is now always going to be your priority no matter what and that is that has been Hunter's through line for the entire series and I I just I loved that he was he was like yeah and you're safe too because that's the most important thing to him Mm-hmm. And and I really like that they had this kind of open endedness too of they can do whatever they want and so can Hunter and Omega and Crosshair and Wrecker, but it as far as we know they decide to rest and how well deserved is that and Omega even says that at the end when she's older of like you all have fought enough this this is my fight and I'm ready to do it. And I like that the, the Bad Batch don't go with her. Um, that they don't... Me too. You know, I just... <sighs> well, now I, now I understand that they don't go with her because that... They're living their individual lives. Like, who knows? Yeah. It's been 10 years. Like, who knows what their lives look like right now? Mm-hmm. But they're not the Bad Batch anymore. They're not off on rogue missions for Sid. They're not doing random little things to make money. They're living on Pabu. They're living their best life. Yeah. <laughs> and Omega needs to go be an adult, I think. Yeah. Um, and make her own decisions. Ugh. And so I know. I'm, just, I'm so satisfied. And this is, this might even be happier than how I felt at the end of season three of The Mandalorian with mm-hmm. Grogu and Din and their cute little house. And totally. Pond. I actually yeah, think yeah. it is because we've got a bigger group here. <laughs> Of people. Also, this is the series finale. Like, we're yeah. not the Mandalorian season three was not. It could be, but it was not. Yeah. And I think that this one was marketed as such. Like, we have all been leading here, yeah. you know. And oh, dang. Yeah. I think you know before we're kind of wrapping up here, but there was a really excellent interview posted on StarWars.com with Jennifer Corbett and Brad Rao. It's very long. It's very in depth. It's great. Definitely, you should go and read the full thing. But I pulled two questions from it um, that I thought might be good to just read, kind of at the end. It's about Omega and the epilogue itself, and like the choice of how they ended the show. And I, I was just really glad to hear from them in in such a a, a lot, like I said, an in depth way. Um, We're always kind of clamoring, I think, for more from these series like this, since we don't have something like Rebels Recon anymore. But StarWars.com asked, I want to talk about the epilogue, which was a really nice surprise. Was it always part of the episode or was it something added later on where you thought, let's do a time jump and show where they end up and possibly a new beginning for Omega? Jennifer Corbett said, I think early in the development of season one, the discussion was really how does it end and how do we see it ending? So we had some discussions about would Clone Force 99 walk away? Are they going to stay in the rebellion? How does it all really come out? And it kept kind of changing as the seasons were progressing. But as we were in season three, we talked a lot about this scene. And I can't remember when we knew what we wanted to do. We wanted it to be a very personal moment because we wanted to show all the training the batch had done and for Omega to be older. And now it's her turn to make a decision in her life as to what path she wants to take. For me, it was personal because I was going off of when I had joined the military and how my parents were obviously very concerned about it. But now I kind of felt like I had to go and make my own choices and decisions. And do you want to read Brad's response, Charlotte? Sure. Brad says, yeah, I mean, 
having sent two kids to college, that moment, a proud moment, but it's so bittersweet and you know your life is going to change. And yeah, it's really interesting, Jen, that you and I had these different points of view on that. And honestly, different members of our team, as we went on making it, shared in those different points of view. It was a very cathartic thing, strangely, for us as creators, but also to be able to show that these soldiers could decide to put their guns down in this terrible time is a beautiful thing. But also the question could maybe come up, if they were still able to help people, why don't they help people? And so we hope that with the epilogue, we're showing that they are doing both. They got to have peace. They got to step aside from the battle, put down their guns, and stop causing more violence. And yet, how could this kid who learned so much from her brother stay out of the fight forever? She couldn't. We just really wanted to show that too. I thought these were such great answers, and I loved hearing them talk explicitly about the epilogue and the choice for Omega to go off. And I feel like we, I feel like we had a similar conversation actually about this, talking about the role of the Jedi as peacekeepers and what does a peacekeeper really mean? And the idea that if you can help someone, you should, but does that have to be your life at the same time? And I think they're kind of talking about a similar thing here of the Bad Batch. They have fought for so long. They deserve to have peace. But at the same time, they've trained this kid and this kid has seen so much of the galaxy and she feels so deeply for the galaxy that she can't at this point in her life, she can't not do anything either. And that there is this balance there. And I really loved their answers. The second question, I, the last one I wanted to read to take us back to the beginning is about the choice to include Omega, which I don't know if we've ever really heard directly, or at least I can't remember right. reading. A, it's a really good question yeah. that they brought up. So Star Wars.com said, I want to zoom way back. The Bad Batch showed up in the Clone Wars, and then it was announced that there was going to be a spinoff show. And Omega was such an unexpected part of that and such a surprise. Was the idea of her in the air when they first, was the idea of her in the air when they first appeared or did that come after the decision was made to do the series? And Jennifer said, it came up in the development of The Bad Batch. I had watched the animatic, which was being worked on for the final season of The Clone Wars, when we started developing this series and was talking about the timeline and where Clone Force 99 would be during Order 66 and what kind of stories we wanted to tell them. Then the discussion led to Omega and the possibility of there being this young clone girl on Kamino who is a misfit or an outcast similar to the Bad Batch. And then how would that affect their team dynamic now that not only is the war over, the Empire is now in power? And they don't want to be a part of it, but now there's this kid that they can't just leave behind because she's considered a defective clone like them. That's how it really started. And I think it was such an exciting decision because when you watch them in the Clone Wars, they're kind of like the guest stars of the mission. Anakin's on the scene. They're doing all this really cool stuff to save Echo. But when you give them their own show, especially in this timeline, it's like, well, what are they doing? And how are you going to really challenge this never fail squad and see different parts of them? It felt like introducing Omega was a challenge. The fact that, oh, now they have to be guardians. And that's very different than being a super elite commando. And Brad Rao says... The biggest challenge ever is becoming space dads. And is that just the, that's that's the end? That's the end. That's the end. <laughs> that's the end. <laughs> that's that's it. Goodbye. <laughs> I I like I said I don't know if I remember or if we really ever have heard about the creative decision to include Omega as part of this show, but as you can tell, we are just so enamored with her, and I liked hearing them talk about this creative process. Totally. One of Star Wars' best characters, I have to say. No, she's just, and the thing is, too, Charlotte, is that they're all alive. So we could see them in other places. Except for tech. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. You said all, and then I was like, okay, we're talking about the Bad Batch as a whole, so I have to. I have to say, but yeah, yeah. Well, the the thing is, last night when I was texting you, I was like, I had this realization that literally none of them have plot armor, meaning that everyone could die. And you, I think, sent me into a spiral. Well, I was sending myself into a spiral. Yeah. So I just brought you with the spiral. Come down. (laughs) Yeah. And I feel like, in the end, it was like (laughs) reverse Rogue One. It's, which is actually funny because Tarkin is like, act, this is going to become Project. All yeah. the money that was used here is going to be in Project Stardust. And really, this truly was like a reverse Rogue One. And I was even thinking about that when you're talking about how the um, like the planets are all secret and they live this secret life. Yeah. And how the sacrifices that we saw with Rogue One were basically secret too. 
And yeah. we didn't know that for so long and people don't really know that. Um, I think it's less secret now that it's being integrated into stories more and things are being named after Rogue One. But at the same time, uh, I feel like the destruction of the Death Star continues to be more of the moment where it cre created like galaxy-wide fame, right, for Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and Princess Leia. So I do feel like... Um, I feel like there is some interesting parallel there, like this reversal, I guess. But I also don't know if I've talked enough about and about how Star Wars, the original trilogy, becomes a story about fatherhood. And oftentimes Star Wars returns back to the concept of the parent-child relationship and how the Bad Batch is just another perspective of that fatherhood, right? Yeah. And it's more explicit than, say, Star Wars Rebels was with the found family aspect. I think Star Wars Rebels is like the – I've said this before on the show – the perfect definition of the found family trope. But I think it's less about fatherhood. as It's more about found family. But yeah. The Bad Batch is about fatherhood. And in that way, it really reflects like the core tenets of like the original Star Wars, right? Yeah. And I, I think it, it explores it in a totally different way. I think we get – it, this goes without saying, but I'll just say it. Like we get flashes of different pieces of fatherhood and exploration of parenthood to um, throughout Star Wars with Anakin to Ahsoka. It's not necessarily. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying beyond. I just think this is. It's the fact that Brad ends this interview with that quote. You know, the biggest challenge ever is becoming space dads, and that is completely summed up in that epilogue too. Yeah. That ability to let go with that as well. <sighs> Okay. <laughs> Be careful to everyone out there when you are watching this episode over and your emotions have calmed or your anxiety has eased because you know how it's going to go because then the then the real emotions will just come as we have experienced. Yeah. And yeah, I'm ready to start the bad batch over again and see them from the very beginning. And now that I know mm -hmm. how everything goes and watch it through that lens, I'm so sad to say goodbye to this show, really, truly. I hope – I know we will see these characters again, and I'm I'm willing to be patient, but I'm also not willing to be that patient. I don't know. My, it's going to feel so good when we see them again. I know. It really is. And I hope we get to hear – I hope we get to hear about their everyday life on Pabu, honestly. Can you imagine, mm -hmm. like, just some little shorts – in a year rather than something so angsty like Tales of the Empire or Tales of the Jedi. <laughs> it's just <laughs> them on sushi making class. And, and, and like, uh, uh, like, okay, hear me out. Wrecker and Crosshair, they open a business together of like woodcraft and Wrecker <laughs> chops the trees. He just like rips them out of the ground and then Crosshair makes them into like beautiful art or something or well, he wouldn't rip anything out of the ground because that's not – He was not – We wouldn't destroy the environment like it's that. Ethic. But it's I, ethical. They He gathers the logs that have already fallen. Driftwood. Driftwood. Drift we did it. Yeah. Driftwood. <laughs> or or Drift maybe wood. I can almost see Crosshair also being like a, um, a glass maker with the lightning and the sand mm -hmm. and blowing glass. I can kind of see that for, that for him too. And they and they sell their wares at the market on Sunday morning at the top of the mountain. <laughs> the beautiful, <laughs> extremely cool market. <laughs> that we only went to like twice. <laughs> yeah, but there's some cool concept art that was really released good. online about it. I, I hope we get, for as much as I want to see what Omega is doing in the Rebellion, and I really want to see that. I do want to see, I hope we get to see at some point the, the shades of their domesticity. Uh, their domestic life on Pabu. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just love that they got that. And I'm tearing up again. I'm just so happy for them. And I'm happy for <laughs> us with this like lovely ending. We And we really did go through so much angst and turmoil and huge, huge loss with tech, you know? So they deserve it. And I cannot be more grateful to the Lucasfilm Animation cast and crew d bradley baker and michelle ong please always be with us forever in the star wars mm -hmm. family mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you so mm -hmm. much seriously thank you it's been such a ride we've covered every single episode i, I remember the first time we watched it to the end yeah. it's crazy it's just 
crazy. We've been through a lot with the show and I'm very, very thankful. Yeah, me too. And thank you all for listening, for following along with us on this Bad Batch journey. I think, I think that's going to wrap it up for us Mm -hmm. on the Bad Batch, Mm -hmm. which I don't know, feels very weird, but thank you all for Mm -hmm. listening. And, you know, actually, I guess before we wrap up, I'll say the Bad Batch was the first set of screeners that Charlotte and I got. I know that's in, what I was going to say in, in Star Wars world and uh-huh. some of our first opportunities to do interviews uh with cast and creators was with Bad Batch. So it it does feel also like very full circle in that kind of way. A fun fact about Sky Talkers is that um if you're a patron of ours and you get a pin sticker package if you join our five dollar tier um i pack all of those myself and i keep all of our supplies we had actually gotten a bad batch um like gift box for season one as well which that was the first time we'd ever received anything like that and i keep all of our supplies for our patron packages in that bad batch box actually i think we got like a bad batch hat and like a figure or something and like oh we got popcorn mantel mix <laughs> in it too. Mantel mix. it was before it was called mantel mix. yeah and anyway i still have that box and i keep all of our patron supply patreon supplies in it and yeah thinking about how even sky talkers has changed since the bad batch came out first came out and how it it started a lot of things for us very th- meaningful yeah. three seasons <sighs> all right okay well that's that is really going to wrap it up. Thank you all again for listening. We hope you guys enjoyed the Bad Batch season series finale and that you also feel satisfied with it. Please let us know what you thought. We would love to hear. You can find us on Twitter at SkyTalkersPod or our personal handles. Mine is at Caitlin Flusher and Charlotte's is at Clarity. We also have our website, SkyTalkers.com, our TikTok, Instagram. Like we mentioned at the top of the show, if you're listening to this in the week of May the 4th, 2024, uh, you should definitely head on over to those social media platforms and see what we've been up to if you want to follow along with our Star Wars adventure this week, um, Star Wars week. And if you have a couple of seconds and would like to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, it would really help others in finding the show and checking it out. And if you're interested in other ways to support us, you can head on over to our Patreon and check out our reward tiers there. I want to say a huge thank you to these patrons, Robin, Kylie, David, Corey, Ben, Emily, Kat, Brooke, Eugene, David, Triumphant Ewok, Pam, GMO, Gary, Jenny, Olivia, Lindsay, Charlotte, Tim, Jonah, Carol, Simon, Tim, Danny, Megan, Becky, James, Nick, Christina, Rachel, Jess, Emma, and Kara. Thank you so much for supporting us. Yes. Thank you guys so much. And until next time, may the force be with you. May the force be with you.